Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, members, and welcome back after what seems to be a very short recess this year. Um, you're all very welcome. Um, dear members of the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee, you're hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee to be held today in the Guildhall on Tuesday, the 1st of September at 4 o'clock. Um, members, starting with the roll call, Councillor Gallagher, Councillor McKeever, Councillor Mooney, Councillor Riley, Alderman Bresland, Alderman Guy, Alderman McClintock, Alderman McCready, Councillor John Boyle, Councillor Michaela Boyle, Councillor Cooper, Councillor Donnelly, Councillor Duffy, and Councillor Fleming. Thank you, members. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll just read out the statement here, broadcasting statement. Uh, I would like to remind everyone who is in attendance that this meeting will be broadcast live via the Council's YouTube channel and will be available for viewing by the public and media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. This broadcast may be determined or suspended in accordance with Council protocol. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A copy of the Council Privacy Notice can be found on the Council website. Okay, everyone. Um, so, declarations of member interest. It's all signed out the public forms there. Leave one. Um, under chairperson's business, I have not myself, but a councillor Boyle can contact me. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity. Um, I just want to put on record um, to congratulate Council corporately for the work they have recently done in lighting up our council buildings blue um, in relation to justice for Noah. Um, Obviously, um, a, a very emotive um, issue, and um, in support of the Donahue family, um, it was only right that Council um, helped uh, in that support by lighting up the buildings. I want to thank the Council officers who were involved in doing that, and everyone involved. And um, you know, obviously, uh, it is an emotive issue. Uh, it still is an issue. Uh, that the family are still seeking justice, regardless of, of commentary, recent commentary. Um, however, I would uh, like to ask that Council still continue to support the family in whatever way and assist them in whatever way they can um, if they request uh, future support. Uh, so thank you, uh, just um, in terms as a councillor, for, for the Straban area where, where the Donoghue family are from. Um, again, just to put my thanks uh, and thanks of all. I'm sure I can speak for everybody here in the chamber today. Thanks to the officers for, for lighting up our buildings, Lou. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Park. Um, and Councillor Riley. Mr. Chair, for letting me in. And uh, can I concur with the comments from uh, Councillor Boyle in relation to the previous item that she's uh, addressed? Uh, we support that campaign. And indeed, uh, Mayor Tierney. Uh, agreed with the, the guild hall clock here to be illuminated blue as part of that campaign. So just to be on the record in support of that. Uh, Chair, thanks for letting me in on the Chair's business. It's just to raise an issue in, in relation to today being the 1st of September, TransLink have introduced uh, new timetables, uh, some of which are impacting on our school, our school children. Uh, in, indeed, a, a constituent has contacted me about uh, the delays that children are face returning home to the city from uh, being at the school outside of the council area, sorry, outside of the city area, but within the council area. So could I ask that the council engage with TransLink in relation to uh, the the new timetables that they are that, that they're introducing to ensure that uh, TransLink take on board the, the concerns that parents have in relation to the times, uh, both of the children being uh, picked up uh, from their homes, which has changed in this instance, and then also when the children are returning, uh, one particular family, their child will be leaving the house, at, uh, the bus picks them up at quarter to eight, 
but the bus doesn't return home until 10 to 5 which is about an hour and a half after the school is closed uh, so the, the parents have concerns as to the well-being of the children waiting around on the bus for over an hour and, a, uh, and about an hour and 20 minutes uh, so chair i think it would be useful if council could uh, ask translink for an update on how they intend to take on the concerns of parents in, in the drafting of the new timetable thank you uh, thank you councillor um she got a letter uh alder mcclintic thanks chair for letting me in just first of all briefly to concur with what councillor boyle said um, none of us can I think fathom the, the depth of despair that the Donoghue family are, are going through at this time and just to concur with the sentiments that Michaela has expressed and also on the issue that Councillor Riley raised, I understand that our office has been contacted about particularly Straban Academy as well, um, so uh, if there's going to be a letter sent, I'll be very supportive of that because it's a, an added burden for children if they have to wait very long times to, to get home, so just to concur with that, thank you. The Alderman McClintic. Anyone else want to know? No. So, um, matters arising from the minutes. The last meeting, Tuesday, 30th of June. Councillor Donnelly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <coughs> GSP 99 forward slash 20. It's the Ned Mason 75th anniversary. I put a, a proposal in that, uh, that given concerns of human rights breaches, this council calls on the 26th County Administration to do all in support of reverse this decision to extradite Ian Campbell to Lithuania. I think, uh, sorry, uh, it's regarding the, the, the motion that I put in under, under GSP 99 forward slash 20, and it was, uh, Given that concerns over human rights breaches, this council calls on the 26th County Administration to do all in its power to reverse its decision to extradite Ian Campbell to Lithuania. That particular uh, item was put back to, to uh, full council, and at full council it, it didn't uh, pass, uh, unfortunately, uh, from my uh, position. But, Chair, there is, there is just some uh, issues that I want to bring up in, in, in connection with that and you know I think it's unfortunate that uh, that this motion wasn't passed at full council and given that the corporate decision of this council was to support the Tony Taylor campaign and given that the same people that his intelligence were behind the reason why Tony Taylor spent uh, a length of time in prison we've seen the activities <coughs> this country knows well the activities of, of, of British intelligence. Uh, I don't have to explain them. Even only last week, we've seen a number of raids and people being uh, imprisoned under draconian legislation, and we've seen the example that that has on on families uh, and this uh, this uh, jurisdiction. So I think it's important. You know, I think it's unfortunate that this didn't uh, go through, and. You know, while some people, I can understand the activities of some people in here not supporting that, I think that on the minutes here, well, there is some people who did support the motion on this meeting. However, when it went to full council, they refused to support it. So I think it would be, you know, uh, remiss of me not to bring that up because that in particular, I know amongst a lot of people, has caused an awful lot of confusion. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Donnelly. Anyone else want to comment? Alderman McClintic. It's, uh, it's related to item uh, 91 slash 20, just about flooding in Ballycoman, and maybe it's loosely connected, so I'm hoping you'll bear with me, Chair. But um, the, the the rains and the, the heavy rains over the last fortnight have raised great concerns again in the Drumoho area, in particular, because Despite the promises of the Department for Interest Infrastructure over the last three years, they still seem to be not very far on with pre um, the preparation of the flood defences. In fact, a letter uh, 
or an email sent to the DFA tells us in another few months' time they will be ready to go for final design. And then another few months after that, it will be out for local consultation. It's three years from those devastating floods uh, that affected people in Eglinton and also in Drumhoe. And obviously during that, that heavy rain over the last period, people have been living on the edge, wondering what had happened again. And I don't think it's good enough for Department for Infrastructure to say three years later that they're only getting to design stage. And I was wondering, uh, Chair, if we could send a letter to ask um, Department for Infrastructure, can this be speeded up in any way? Because people are living in real fear. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman McClendon. Uh, Martin, ready? Thanks, Chair. Just formally happy to second that request from Alderman McClendon. Yeah, was that? Yeah. Martin Riley, second. Councillor Riley, second. The proposal, Chair, simply was that we write to DFI asking can we expedite the it's three years from those flooding. Um, I don't know whether I need to be more, any more specific in that, but I'm sure a letter could be drawn up, Chair. Thank you. Anyone else there now? Chair, uh, again, regarding the flooding, uh, and we've seen at that time, uh, there was uh, the responsibility of the flooding uh, was put down to uh, potential act of vandalism by a third party. Um, you know, right? I thought you were going to make an announcement there. Uh, and um, very recently, we've seen more flooding from the same place uh, and the same current theme that's happening, but Council was, was quick to be on the ground, uh, providing some assistance. However, there was a, a, a number of claims that have been made under the, the flooding scheme. I think there was 18 in total, but the vast majority uh, that people got the houses flooded were informed by a letter saying that uh, they'd been turned down. And I've said in the letter that the right to appeal. However, it, the letter just said it didn't fit the criteria. So residents were left a wee bit uh, bewildered by the fact that they could make an appeal, but they didn't know on which grounds they were turned down. If the letter had a command that says you were turned down because A, B, C, D, E, and F, then you had the potential to write back and, and say, well, this is what happened. A, B, C, D, and E, but there was no list of why they were turned down. So they, technically they can't make an appeal because they don't know why they were turned down. So I think that we have some responsibility to those uh, claimants that they are informed in detail of why they were found to be ineligible. And, and then they would be in a position to make an appeal. But in the absence of that, now, on top of that, just to uh, inform the committee that, that the mayor has taken on an initiative of working with residents and he's called a, a meeting with a various bodies next week. So I'm aware the mayor's going to be taking it forward, but, but the carp and we've had a letter in today uh, that's on a, a new report, but it, it fails to address the issues that that have arisen in the Baracoma state for, for many, many a time. I think that that letter was just uh, a cop out of the position they find themselves in. So I think the corporate position of council needs to be more, more stronger on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gogger. Do you mean that DFI gave no, there was no reasons on their forms or council? So, council. The letter came from council and it just says, to inform you that uh, you did not meet the criteria and you have a right to appeal. But if you don't know what the criteria actually was, like people had their houses flooded, you know, the, there was no uh, 
there was no ambiguity that council officers were there and seen houses were flooded, but it just said you did not meet the criteria. And, and out of the 18, I think there was five successful claims. So it, there's uncertainty, why did they get and why didn't, did, did they not? So I think there needs to be uh, uh, further explanation, maybe uh, dug out to see if we can satisfy the, the, the process. So, Chair, just picking up on that, um, and th thanks for clarifying that, Councillor Gallagher. So, I presume this is in relation to the scheme of emergency financial assistance to thousand farmers. Um, so, if that that is certainly something that's assessed by environmental health. So, I'll follow that up from today and um, see what letters have been issued and what the what the situation is in line with the provision of that condition um, with Burnish and our resident with the intention of providing. Chair. Councillor Riley. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just uh, to support Councillor Gallagher uh, in the comments that he's made and to thank John for his response. I am are, are conscious that, as Councillor Gallagher has indicated, the Mayor will be meeting with uh, people on this in, in the days ahead. Uh, Councillor Jason Barr, who's not a member of this committee, had asked me to raise this as well. It was going to come up when it comes up under item 19, but happy to do that here now uh, just to support. The comments made in relation to uh, there is confusion as to why out of the 18 uh, households who claimed some did uh, get the grant and were successful and others didn't. Uh, so uh, I welcome the commitment from the chief executive to bring some clarity uh, to the situation and also uh, to to give support to the all the people who were affected by the by the flooding. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Riley. Councillor Boyd. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you uh, for allowing me in. And I want to be associated with the comments made by Councillor Geller in relation to to the issue uh, and the matter in hand. And I know uh, some of the residents have contacted the local councillors in, in regard to it. Um, I mean, the, the letter was very vague. Um, it said the council officers have made a determination on the applications received on the 21st of August. And out of those 18, only five were deemed uh, eligible for financial assistance. Um, there is an appeal process in place, so I would just be of mindful to um, maybe ask Council who, how many of those have appealed, have gone to second stage appeal, and, and, and we'll just to see what the outcome would be out of that. Uh, I think that involves a second inspection, and um, a lot of the houses have obviously worked tirelessly um, to get their houses cleared of the debris that, 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 uh, as a result of the, the flooding. Um, so it is, it is an issue. Um, the residents were very deeply disappointed and, and, and angry um, because of, I mean, everybody, we were all there. We saw the flooding council officers were there on the night and, and actually saw the, the, the homes um, flooded for the second time within a, a small period of time. So, uh, again, I just want to be um, connected to the comments made earlier by Councillor Gallagher and that I wish that Council would do everything in their power corporately to ensure that those who weren't eligible for funding could apply for second stage appeal. And, you know, obviously the criteria is set by DFI and not by this Council, but if there's any flexibility at all in this... Um, and there's any opportunity within that of flexibility around the criteria that those residents who have been flooded that would get financial assistance going forward would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Board. Thank you, Lawyer. Just, uh, if I could maybe um, provide some clarity. This is not a, this is not about um, the council give out these grants to the administrator, but they have to claim it back from the Department of Communities, and they have to be justification and process and around all that but it's, it's just the clarity for the people on the ground to say in order to make an appeal because from my understanding they can't make an appeal if you don't know why you were turned down in the first place so the letter that comes out from council needs to provide clarity of why you were ineligible so or how council feels are ineligible and then the residents who were flooded can better present their appeal they can't present an appeal if they don't have clarity of why they were turned down. So that, that's where the that's where the confusion is of why people got and why people didn't, how people met the criteria, 
how people haven't. For a letter just to say you haven't met the criteria, but you can make an appeal, doesn't allow for an appeal. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Council Order. Anyone else? No. You are right there. Uh, okay, um, we'll move on then for um, item 7, uh, financial return update and Alfie, we'll give us a rundown on that. Thank you Chair. Um, members, item 7 is for you to consider and approve our quarter 1 financial outturn at 30th of June and also members to note the importance of securing continued central government support for the remainder of the financial year. Um, just very quickly, by way of background, we have a gross expenditure budget this year of 75 million, of which 11 million is funded from our service income and service grants, leaving a net expenditure budget of 63.93 million, which is funded mainly from rates, rate support grant, transferring functions grant, and also some funding from reserves. Um, members, you're obviously brought quarterly updates to this committee in relation to performance against budget, in particular to identify any financial issues or pressures. Um, obviously, members, for the first three months, our finances have been significantly impacted with um, a lot of services not operating during quarter one and a significant element of staff either in furlough or working from home. Significant income losses from um, our services, mainly leisure, planning, building control and off-street car parking, along with exceptional expenditure, which has had to be incurred. So on that basis, it's a very um, unusual variance report um, presented in the report today. Um, so that's set out in Appendix 1 and summarised in the table in Section 3.1 of the report. So the very key message from that, members, is that in the absence of government support, we would have incurred a deficit of 1.638 million in council services in quarter one, and that deficit would have been increased by a further 350k had we not been able to receive government support for our city of Derry Airport. The key issues in that, members, um, obviously leisure facilities being closed um, resulted in 645k um, of that. Um, overall total as a result of loss of income. Car parking contributed 275k, again loss of income. Building control 136k, um, with building control applications having reduced by 60% in the first quarter. Um, planning income members has remained on budget in quarter one despite the pandemic. Um, environment and regeneration has been impacted by over 400k due to waste management pressures and again loss of income from commercial refuse and street cleansing. Um, provision has been made for compensation events associated with capital contracts which are ongoing and 95k of exceptional costs have been incurred. Um, thankfully, members, that has been fully cover covered by government support. Um, to date, we have secured 2.8 million of government support from Department for Communities, Financial Losses, the Furlough Scheme, and DERA Waste Management. And over 1.8 million of that has been applied to the quarter one um, budgets. So, whilst government support has been critical, members, obviously during quarter one, only essential expenditure has been incurred also, which has helped. Um, keep our finances stable and avoided any significant decisions around services um, thus far. So looking forward, members beyond quarter one, unfortunately a lot of the areas of under overspend will continue into quarter two and beyond and a number of further bids have been submitted to government in that regard. Again to Department for Communities, a 1.3 million bid for financial losses, a bid to DERA for waste management losses of over 600k and in relation to CODA, further support has been ring-fenced by government until March 21 and discussions are progressing to um, finalise the letter of offer in relation to that. And we will also continue to avail of the furlough scheme where possible, members, although the benefit of that will obviously reduce as facilities open. Um, the majority of these bids haven't been approved yet, members. Indeed, the initial DERA bid wasn't approved, but we're hopeful that that will be reconsidered. So the very key message from today's report, members, is that in the absence of continued government support, this will have major implications for our reserves and our service provision, so it's critical that pressure is applied where possible to ensure that the required funding is made, made available. 
So just um, before I finish, and members point out a couple of other issues. The report has not made any assumptions in relation to rate base impact. Um, currently, we're getting one twelfth of our rates for the year from government at the start of each month. So the risk really is towards the end of the year where we find out our finalisation figures. Thankfully, the government exemptions um, hopefully will mitigate um, a good element of that loss, although what, what it won't mitigate is if a business is no longer there, it won't be able to avail of the relief. So there still remains a risk, and it's important we have contingencies for that. And also there are still risks of appeals against the recent non-domestic revaluation. So as you're aware, one of the asks that we have of government is that um, rates payments made to council from central government are paid on the basis of estimates for this year and the next two financial years with any negative finalisations being underwritten. Separately to this, members, we obviously need to plan if there's no government funding available and a contingency plan has been developed in that regard separately for your considerations. And just finally, members, um, in relation to the rates process, it will obviously be very challenging given that a lot of the issues will continue beyond March and um, planning has already commenced in that and you'll be aware we normally do briefings in December but those will now come at the end of this month, beginning of October um, there will be briefings arranged to bring you up to speed with where we're at. So members, you're asked to approve the three-month financial position and note the importance of securing continued government support for the remainder of the financial year. Thank you. Chair, um, and thank you to the officer for that very detailed report, members. And just to um, briefly add to that, um, it, it's, it's a very pleasing position to be at the end of the first quarter of this year um, uh, with no significant financial detriment. Um, there's been a huge amount of work done by Alfie and his team, and indeed, uh, and liaison with the other councils uh, to, to present to the executive bids. And we must commend the executive for um, the speed within which they have responded uh, to councils for quarter one. Um, so up to June, as Alfie has said, um, it's, been, it's been a good result. Um, we currently have bids in, which are probably as a result of uh, the, the recess during the summer taking a little more time to work through, but it's, it's just as crucial, members, um, that regional government um, assist councils through quarter two and indeed quarter three and quarter four, hopefully with a diminishing amount through each quarter. Um, but the point that Alfie made um, toward the end, which is one that we can't afford um, to, to, to lose and keep in our sights, um, is the potential impact, and we've talked about it before, on our particularly our non-domestic rate space, and our proposal to government that the only way um, to, to, to get us through this crisis is to maintain um, the level of rates, the estimated level of rates at the beginning of this year. In other words, whatever impact there is in business over the next year, 18 months, two years, that that is not passed on to councils. Otherwise, we will be in a position um, when we move into the autumn, uh, late autumn and early winter, where we will find it almost impossible to set the rate base for next year. Um, uh, I'm not trying to be over dramatic um, about this, um, but obviously we have seen some impact already in the retail sector. Um, possibly, hopefully not, but possibly any further impact in the retail sector may take place post Christmas. Uh, at a time when you're trying to strike the rates um, and we won't know what that impact is and we will find it exceptionally difficult um, to strike rates and in doing so you may then need to make conservative estimates about what we need to put in place for the rates at a time when we simply can't be raising rates to the level that we might have to compensate for thus further exacerbating the situation so at this early stage in the autumn I would really reinforce um, the message to to uh, colleagues in the executive, which is um, thank you for the support to date. Please continue that throughout this year, um, but very importantly engage with councils with respect to the two-year funding horizon, um, with the solution being um, to maintain rates at the estimated levels at the beginning of this year. Um, that will see no growth for us if there is a little bit of growth, um, but it's far better that 
can see very significant loss because all of our strategic plans will be compromised if we can't have certainty as to where we're going financially. And we will tailspin into uh, trying to find um, huge savings potentially to compensate for something that we're not quite sure will happen or not. Um, and I think that will have such a detrimental impact on council service delivery, uh, council finances, and on the organisation as a whole and how we proceed. So there is a very clear, crisp solution to this that councils, the 11 councils, are with one voice promoting um, to the executive. And um, amid all of this detail, sometimes it's, 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 uh, it's hard to see the, the simple message. Um, maintain the, um, the uh, work done to date to, to keep us solvent during this year. And we are playing our own part in that by reducing costs and reducing expenditure. Um, but please work with us over the next couple of months to resolve this issue prior to the accessing state, um, which will be extremely detrimental to, to all of us uh, in council and to our peers. And we don't think we're solved. Thank you, Chair. All right, John, thanks for that there. And I'll be thanks for the presentation. Uh, Councillor Cooper, do you want to do? Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, the Alfie for the reports. And also John's comments there in terms of the support from the executive, I think, are <clears throat> in terms of um, the support that was there and comments that were made previously when these bonds were being prepared, it's that we were going to get short changed by certain departments. Comments that were made on live radio in some instances have been uh, very much refuted by uh, what we have now seen in this report. The fact we can, in relative terms, say we have a, a good news story, the fact we have a small surplus showing compared to what could have been and the absolute tsunami we were potentially facing if there hadn't been adequate support from central government and uh, you know I would be confident that the central government will come up to the mark again in terms of quarter two in terms of those bids I think they recognize without offering that support we're going to end up in a potentially very uh, dangerous position uh, again for for quarter two in terms of the, the rates comments um, again what's coming back to ourselves around um, presentations that have been made through Solace, for example, in terms of the 11 councils around the potentially preparing for underwriting of rates. Um, I think, again, there's a willingness to work with councils on that. One particular thing coming back was, and, and it's, it is difficult in terms of that we are looking at an unknown in one sense, but if it was any indicative figures at all, ballpark figures that we could um, put forward to the department to try and get things framed in a wee bit more structure, uh, a wee bit more certain that any sort of figure they could be working with that would be helpful uh, in the same way we've done with obviously the bids for quarter one and for quarter two. Um, I know that is difficult, but it'll give them some sort of a ballpark to work with. So if, uh, again, if Alfie wants to come back their sales on that, not an issue, but that's uh, something again that we're getting noises back that there will be a willingness to work on that issue. We're in early stages, obviously, of that. Um, but uh, we can hopefully get some progress made in that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Cooper. Uh, Councillor Riley. Uh, thanks, Chair, for bringing me in, and thanks to Alfie and to John for uh, the report that they've made here this afternoon. Um, it is clear from the figures that uh, at the end of quarter one, uh, the, the Council is in a good financial position. Uh, but the, the worry, obviously, as John has outlined, is that we need to see that continue in uh, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four, and then including uh, getting prepared for uh, the rates estimates uh, in the years ahead. I concur with what John is saying in relation to uh, the certainty that could be given from the executive uh, in relation to the uh, the rates base going forward, because I think that will be uh, beneficial for us when we're coming to strike the rate next year. Uh, on that point, I welcome the opportunity to sit down with Alfie and the team in finance uh, in, the, in the weeks ahead about planning for uh, the striking of the rate uh, because I think that that's where the problem is going to be is that uh, the, the, the impact on businesses and so on will be kicking in at that time and as John has alluded to uh, that, that it will be very difficult to strike a rate when we are trying to deal with the impact uh, on businesses and, and without knowing what that impact uh, will be. It's very difficult to, to come to a conclusion about what the rate should be. Uh, I'm conscious, John, you touched on the fact that the, the retail sector will usually be looking forward to the Christmas uh, intake 
uh, but I'm also conscious that it entwined in with that is the Frodo scheme coming to an end at the end of this year. But the Chancellor having indicated that there'll be a, a bonus payment per employee of a thousand pounds, which will kick in in January. So you might find that uh, that some employers are able to keep staff on until the early New Year and then uh, let those staff go, unfortunately, because that's when uh, the, the the time uh, for the bonus uh, that the employer will get will come to an end. So. I think that it's very difficult to know what the picture will look like financially in January, uh, but we will do what we can uh, to try and, uh, and have the conversations with, uh, with council officers in relation to how the council itself uh, handles its own finances uh, and identifying if there are savings and if there are ways that, that, that we can reduce our outgoings, uh, which will help. Uh, but I think the, the, the continued effort of council uh, officers in relation to working with Nelga, Solas and, and every other opportunity that we have uh, to speak as one voice is the best way to uh, to attract uh, the, the certainty from the executive that we that, that we all need. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Councillor Riley. Uh, Alderman McClintic. Thanks, Chair, and on a similar vein to the previous speakers, I'd like to thank Alfie and Joe and John for the tremendous amount of work that you have put into preparing the, not only this report but all the work that has gone on in the background as well. Um, it's not nearly as devastating as what it might have been, and I think we're all very thankful to central government for the funds that we have received so far. And I suppose um, just to reassure. Uh, council corporate that from our point of view obviously as others will do we will continue to lobby uh, that councils are not forgotten as they haven't been during this pandemic and we will use whatever influence we can as well to make sure that the um, the rate support is based on the estimated amount. Um, I think it's incumbent upon all of us at this time to make sure that we don't put any additional pressures on council with spending, sometimes in the way that we would have done during the year before asking for different things. We, we are going to have to cut our cloth for the next uh, foreseeable time. And obviously it is worrying going forward into the whole rates process and very mindful that obviously we will be constrained by not only the rates base but what actually the public can afford to pay. So just um, really in a similar vein to the other uh, speakers, just very supportive of what uh, has been done so far. Thank you. Alderman McClintic, uh, Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, just one bit of clarification there. Alfred, did you say the the Dara, the Dara bud wasn't considered, and, it, and there was a, like a reconsideration as well, therefore it was torn down. Um, yeah, the initial the the bid was submitted. I understand onto a monitoring round bid, so it wasn't successful initially. But they've been asked to resubmit it onto the next monitoring round, so it's still live, um, which is better position than it was a couple of weeks ago, obviously. So hopefully, it's still live. Um, just maybe thanks, Alfred, for the report and feedback. And I think I. Um, I think there's a lot of, lot of things that we as a council need to think about. How and some that can be very grim reading when you, when you see it, the debt. But how, uh, as we go forward, and we go into next year, I would have great concerns around a lot of this uh, potential debt getting put onto the domestic rate pair. And that I think this council needs to do almost per. Uh, to avoid that, like we see with the the current uh, conditions that that are and guidelines that are, that are being uh, put on businesses, where their their turnaround, their annual turnaround, uh, has has not stopped. It will have halved uh, in, in certain quarters where the social distancing and, and the guidelines are put in place doesn't allow for business to have a, a projected turnover that we were basing our rates on previously. Therefore, they're going to come in next year with, with a, a complete uh, figure that's potentially half. So if we were talking about just on our estimates and us pulling previously estimates of 31 million, then we could be seeing a 15 million loss of those, those businesses. The rate value had halved. 
And where's that 15 million going to come from? The only place it can come from is, as we, as, as a controller, as a domestic repair. And I think that if, if that happened, I, it would have, we'd have serious uh, consequences to pay that our domestic repairs would refuse to pay such a hike. So I think that we need to be trying to get ahead of the game that that doesn't happen. Like, and we also, as, as council, like we employ a thousand people. So, so uh, and thereabouts, so we need to be trying to provide confidence to all those staff that we're going to be going forward on a level playing field that we've seen pre-COVID, uh, and we have a lot of work to do on that. So, like I thank officers for the for the reports to uh, that they're bringing forward. But I think we need to be doing some real serious planning, some serious proactivity around how we're going to meet a shortfall that we can see coming down the road, that we can see central government saying, we all have to pay, we're all in this together, uh, but the burden getting put on the domestic repair, so we need to avoid that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Sure, yeah, just, yeah. just through you and just in relation to that last comment by Councillor Gallagher, I think that's why it's so important that we get the figures that Councillor Cooper mentioned to the executive as quickly as possible to try to um, ensure that we don't have to have that debate because the, we really only have one alternative if that, if that, if that um, so while we can continue to be more efficient, and we should always try to be so. There's obviously a limit to that for the amounts of services we're staffing in. Um, and we certainly don't want to be in a position as a council if we go into the late autumn where that uncertainty um, causes us to start reviewing very significant potential service cuts that we might have to put in place in February. So um, we, we are bringing this to you in a very early manner and we're working through Solus and Milgo, as any of the members have said to ensure that at a time of great uncertainty that councils um, within a very short period can be on the front foot and say to its citizens and to its ratepayers, these are difficult times, but we have a plan, we have a strategy, we're moving forward with certainty, not we as well in council are faced with significant financial pressures and we're going to have to start cutting services and charges. We do not want to be in that position. Um, and hence why we're bringing it so early to you. We will get the figures to the executive and we need the executive to work with us to try to get an early resolution to this matter before we run out of time. And that debate starts because that debate will be very negative if it does start. And, and that's the point that we're trying to convey today. Okay, thank you, John, for that. Do you have a proposal and a second there? Or? Thank you, Chair. It's just to clarify in relation to the information being provided to LPS. Um, up until recently, we haven't had the very detailed analysis of all our rate base. Um, we've now got that from LPS and have been working very hard to analyse that. So the initial analysis of that, to that non-domestic rate base, would be that 40% of it is relatively secure because it's public sector, it's hospitals, it's education, it's those types of things. So we're now on to analysing that other 60%, which is subjective, a lot of assumptions around. So each council is working through that process, and we will have to come up with, with assumptions to inform our rates process. So that's very close to being completed, that exercise, now that we have the information. OK, thanks, Alfie. Uh, do you want to come back and answer the Thanks for that, Alfie. Did you see what I would say is, uh, Alfie, on, on that uh, last comment there? See, see the, that projection? Mm -hmm. That technically disadvantages this council area because a lot of the, a lot of the, the big public buildings and, and the government departments that pay rates are not in this location. So across the board, the, the better off councils will still remain better off under these conditions. You know, when you work that percentage out, we'll still be at a high disadvantage because of, of all those centralised buildings that you're talking about. You know, the big education authorities, 
the housing executives, the stormer buildings, the government buildings, they're all based in around central Belfast. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Gallagher. I need a seconder there. Robert Member Clintic, thank you. Uh, okay, have item eight. I'll try again for Prudential and Treasury Management and the Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. Item eight members is to approve our Prudential and Treasury Management Indicators Actual Outturn for nineteen twenty. Um, this is a statutory requirement, and um, in accordance with that requirement, we approved as part of the rates process for 1920 um, a range of prudential indicators and a detailed report setting out our actual outturn as, as compared to that estimate as set out in the appendix. Um, I'll just pick out the key points, members. Um, we incurred capital expenditure of 8.6 million during 1920. We have a closing finance requirement financing requirement of 60 million which essentially represents the amount of money we either have borrowed or are required to borrow to finance capital projects um, at this date. Um, our actual borrowing against that was 46.8 million and that all members goes to fund um, capital projects within our strategic growth plan. Um, we have not breached our operational boundary or our authorised limit for borrowing. And finally, we earned interest from investments with approved institutions totaling 27k and a further 4k on interest on um, car loans. Um, finally, very important point, members, um, in line with our approved Treasury management policy for that year, we've endeavoured to use surplus cash, um, which we have got from in-year savings, etc., to replace the need to borrow for capital projects in the short term and therefore save on loan interest. And in line with that, this, we have not yet borrowed for capital projects from last year, giving us a saving of 204k, um, which is significant and which is something we want to continue to do through our Treasury policy for, for this year, which is on today's agenda as well. So, members, um, you're asked to approve our Prudential and Treasury Management Indicators actual outturn for 1920. Thank you. Okay, Alfie, thank you for that there. Um, Councillor Cooper. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Alfie, for the report. Um, in particular, the last uh, reference there to the fact we're going to use cash um, to draw down for loans as opposed to taking out loans to, to, for um, loan funding because we had the motion obviously came out a few months ago around dealing with historical loans, which is still an ongoing, um, and that, that's still ongoing in terms of the, the high levels of interest we were paying on those. So, taking the approach from now on as much as we can. We will use uh, use cash reserves instead as I think a no-brainer, it's, and it's very very welcome because it will create much less issues for this council in 10 or 15 or 20 years' time compared to the issues we have currently with loans that were taken out in some cases over 30 years ago at exorbitant rates of interest. So very very happy to propose uh, this uh, this item. Anyone else? Prince Riley. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair, and thanks, Alfie, for that. Uh, similar to what we discussed at the motion I tabled back before recess, I uh, agree with Councillor Cooper uh, in the sense of uh, that if we are uh, managing our finances, finances that we do, we do so uh, 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 with the best favourable terms available uh, at the time. Uh, so happy enough to second the report here from Alfie this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Uh, anyone else? Uh, right, okay, thank you for that there. Um, item 9, Paula. Thank you, Chair. And the purpose of this report is to update members and seek endorsement on how we plan to progress the recognition of relevant workers during the emergency coronavirus period. Um, council members have previously requested that we consider formally recognising key workers for their work during the period. Um, management have considered some options and um, it's recommended that we bring these options for consideration to the pay, the pay working group which was previously set up to consider the harmonisation issues and a, a meeting has been provisionally arranged now for the end of September for this meeting. 
Um, at this stage, there's no implications associated with this report. It's recommended that members endorse, endorse the approach suggested and a further report will then be brought, brought back to committee for consideration. Okay. Oh, thank you for that there. Um, there's no point in anybody coming on this. They're all going to the working group. Is everybody happy enough with that there? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, would be item 10 for Ellen? Um, through you, Chair, the um, purpose of this report is to invite members' consideration and approval of the draft annual performance report for 2019-20, which is attached as Appendix 1. Um, just by way of background, uh, under the Local Government Act 2014, uh, we are required uh, under Section 90 to assess our performance and achieve our improvement objectives and to measure performance against performance indicators or standards set by the department or any other indicators that we or targets we set ourselves. And we need to do this on an annual basis. Um, again, as I say, the um, members will be reminded that given the impact of, of COVID-19, as the report indicates here, the Department for Communities made a decision in June 20 uh, to set aside the requirement to produce a uh, and publish a performance improvement plan for the year 2021. However, in, in August there, the department uh, wrote to advise the councils will still be required to publish the performance improvement assessment report covering 1920 with a publication date of the 30th of September. And that obviously is a statutory requirement. Um, the going forward uh, again as i say the department have also advised that they're t seeking the views of councils and the local government auditor um, in terms of the forward plan uh, with regard to the performance improvement duty and indeed they're saying that going forward it might be more beneficial for councils to produce plans setting out their proposals for service delivery and performance recovery as opposed to the performance improvement plan uh, or, and objectives approach which is there at the minute um, and obviously that work is currently uh, taking place. The performance uh, report which is set out in appendix one uh, is broken down into a number of headings as indicated under 3.1 um, and in overall terms I, th I would suggest to members that progress has been made that, well in terms of delivering our improvement objectives, which again are linked as appropriate to the inclusive uh, growth plan. Um, there's also evidence of improvements in respect of our statutory indicators and positive trends have been identified in a number of areas where we currently collect performance data. Um, and again, as I say, going forward, the Council is fully committed to, to enhancing monitoring and reporting systems. Um, once the document, um, as I say, hopefully is agreed, it will be reproduced in a final design format, which will make it a wee bit more accessible to users, and a summary reversion will also be prepared. Members are therefore asked um, that subject to your comments to approve for publication the draft annual performance report. Um, I would highlight that all references there in that report should be to 1920. Thank you, members. Okay, well, thank you for that report. Um, Councillor Duffy, Yeah, thank you, Chair, for allowing me in, and thank you, Ellen, for the report. Um, Ellen, I don't have um, a lot of questions, just probably some comments from, from going through it. It is clear to see that there is significant work continuing um, towards um, achieving our corporate objectives, and, and that work has continued post COVID as well and during that COVID period. So. And even when we went into lockdown, probably early March, work did continue then as well. 
Um, it, it was good to see in the report the importance of our, our website and our social media platforms. And I, I would expect probably next year that those numbers will go up again, considering the importance of those platforms in terms of getting out public health messages and whatnot throughout um, the last six months of COVID. Um, just in terms of the objectives, um, one of the objectives was around the economic growth. And I think that that is a really important one, considering um, conversations that we've had in here. Um, I think as recently as July in terms of the inclusive growth deal and the fact that we did wish to have skills and stuff included within that, um, but unfortunately um, revenue wasn't part of the city deal fund. But I think that it does need to absolutely be a cross-cutting theme and skills are going to be vitally important for our young people and for our citizens as we reset services and reset where we're at and come out of it. Um, we, we need... Um, our young people and our citizens to have the skills to compete and to do well within, within whatever society we see ourselves coming into now. Um, and then just around the healthy cities, um, probably it's never been a more important objective than it is now in the current situation. And I think that, uh, you know, our overall physical and emotional and mental well-being is vitally important. So that is, that's a really important objective now going forward. And then just finally, I wanted to say it, it's really heartening and good to see the amount of work that has been done and the amount of things that have been achieved, particularly around um, the capital projects um, and what has been delivered on the ground um, and, and what is now uh, currently being started on the ground. And I probably just mentioned three in my own area for, for, to be parochial about it, but the, I mean, it, the Lee Fair Pavilion, and Wellbeing Village is a fantastic asset to our community in the Ballyarna DA. So I, I, I think council needs to be commended on that. And then finally to see work beginning on um, the Chantal Community Centre and the, then work due to start very shortly on the Gallia Community Centre, two projects that have been long overdue um, for our area. And if you go through it, I mean, it's, 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 it's each DAA has a success story coming out coming out of this report and I think the council needs to be congratulated for that because it is great to see that things have been delivered on the ground. We've talked about them for a very long time and sometimes people find it difficult to imagine what, what this will look like but when you see th diggers on the ground and when you see buildings going up um, people then get, get the feel for it so I think council needs to be congratulated for that. So thank you and I'm happy to propose the report. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Anyone else? Yeah. There was a seconder for that? Thanks. Uh, Alan, if you want to item 11 there. Through you, Chair. Uh, this report uh, presents members with and seeks approval for a revised safeguarding policy for children and adults at risk, and obviously all of the accompanying uh, documentation that goes with the policy. Um, again, by way of background, the, this council has had a safeguarding policy uh, in place since uh, 2017, but we've um, found it necessary to review that, and that work has been facilitated by the, um, the local government safeguarding network, which is, is a regional group of, of officers, and also from an internal um, safeguarding working group, which comprises members of staff from various sections across the council. Um, and obviously, the key purpose of review unit was to embed any learning and, and good practice within the, the revised document. Um, key changes are, are highlighted probably under section three there, where, as I say, notably, we've actually changed the name of the policy um, to that, as I say, to safeguarding policy, children and, and adults at risk. Um, again, good practice now suggests that that's far more appropriate. Um, than the previous title. Um, again, it's also recognised, and I think um, Councillor Duffy touched on this, that what we have seen in terms of some of our frontline services is that people sort of engaging with services who may have mental health issues. And whilst um, even being presented with, you know, um, suicide ideation, Again, once it's not a safeguarding issue, which is recognised through the, the trust gateway referral system or system, which is the main conduit which we use the, for safeguarding, um, a section has been included in the policy now to help staff 
um, identify immediate steps you can take to ensure the individual gets help and support that they need. Um, in terms of the obligations as well under the general uh, data protection and that's the GDPR regulations, we've made the, the new policy more robust and hopefully we've made the reporting pathways uh, more efficient and effective um, for both um, for staff to actually comply with. Um, again, in terms of accessibility, what we've done is we've prepared a staff guidance document rather than read the, the masses of, of, of paperwork that there is associated with this policy and also a summary document for users. Um, and again, as, as I say, we've um, again made more robust our photography and, and video and, um, application within it. Obviously, I mean, a policy of this uh, nature is cross cutting, and at 3.9, we've identified that in terms of actually um, making sure that the policy is mainstreamed across the organization, um, we've identified the need to uh, do face to face or WebEx training sessions, develop an e learning module um, for the staff uh, learning pool, um, refresh membership of the internal group as well to keep uh, that dynamic and obviously um, work with, uh, in terms of signage throughout our facilities. Um, members are therefore asked um, that, as I say, in terms of, of the new safeguarding policy and children and adults at risk policy, um, to um, forward any comments and, and obviously we'd seek your approval. Thank you, members. Hi, thanks, Fadel. Councillor Rennie. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Alan, for talking us through that. I, I don't have any additional points to raise other than to thank you for the work of the team that, that have, uh, has been put into producing this and to put the formally proposal. Thank you. Councillor Boyle. Uh, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Ellen, um, for that. Um, um, I suppose I just want to put on record um, or, or, and welcome the report and the recommendations within it, and it, and it is good to see that bullying is included within that also, uh, within that report. Um, it is uh, not just inappropriate behaviour or abuse, abuse, but that bullying is now being acknowledged as a form of abuse, um, particularly in, in, in our places where we do have the likes of young people in our premises, where there's youth clubs and that the thing. Um, so it's good to have that included. Um, obviously, uh, 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 to make people and, and, and those aware of the safeguarding policies and they're trained within that. So just on 2.3, Ellen, the main purpose of the internal working group is to ensure that there are robust arrangements for safeguarding children and adults who are at risk. The group is responsible for ensuring that the approved policy and procedures are being implemented correctly and consistently throughout our council facilities and across the council services and activities. And it's just probably just a question: How often does that happen? I mean, you know, in terms of our the council's premises, how often does our officers go out and check that you know those who are um, providing the services within our buildings are? Uh, aware of the safeguarding policies? Is that something they do annually or is it mm -hmm. something that is reviewed within their own services that they're providing uh, within our premises? Um, through you, Chair. The policy document itself, I mean, I, I suppose, um, by way of background again, it identifies roles and responsibilities for a number of officers across the council, and that includes line managers. Mm -hmm. In terms of the, the particular internal group, um, what we see as a key role is, is those are people who are engaging uh, directly with the public and are actually seeing the issues and are actually a very good um, mechanism for alerting us to new developments and, and experiences and, and obviously the opportunity then for everyone to input to how we could do better and, and actually improve our processes. In terms of, of the um, review mechanism as such, what we are very conscious of doing, there is a documentation process as part of safeguarding, so there's an incident report effectively, and what we're doing is feeding that incident report back into the corporate team, which is really the policy officers and myself, and then we do learning logs, so that whilst we keep everything anonymised, um, we're actually getting, um, as, as I say, feedback in terms of what's happening across the organisation. Um, 
I suppose this is, I mean, the reality of it is no one officer can be everywhere at all times. So it's very important in terms of the training and engagement with all of our staff so that everybody can really be the eyes and the ears in terms of safeguarding, uh, in terms of the uses of our facilities. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. And it's good to know that, that the officers are getting the feedback from the organizations as well because that it's critical with the key element within the, the whole policy. So, no, thank you, Ellen, for that. And again, just to support the recommendations in the report. Second. Anyone else, sir? I think yeah. yeah. Item 12. Yeah. Um, this report, uh, through you, Chair, relates to the revised disability action plan for the council in accordance with our duties under section 49 of the disability discrimination order. Um, again, the report sets out the background to the legislation in that we are required to promote positive attitudes towards people with uh, um, a disability and also to encourage participation by disabled people in public life. Um, and in order to require uh, comply with this statutory duty, Council has to review and submit a, a draft um, disability action plan to the Equality Commission for the period of 2020 to 2023. Um, and members may remember that we previously put forward the disability scheme to this committee. Um, so this is the, the, the next action in terms of that. Um, the, the disability action plan itself was subject to full consultation for a 12-week period. Um, and two responses which are, were received and they have been um, reflected within the, the uh, amendments to the action plan. Um, as indicated in the report, the action plan is structured under four main headings and there are over three, 30 key activities which will be imp uh, um, implemented over that three year period. Now obviously, I mean, given the, the, the uh, times that we're in, that they're, you know, we're probably trying to uh, identify areas where we may mitigate any deviation from those plans and also have to recognise the vulnerability of some of the key stakeholders who are actually involved. So again, we'll be looking at um, how we communicate, use of technology, etc. Um, there isn't, as I say, deemed to be any significant financial implications in terms of, of of this particular report as section 75 duties are, are part of our key functions and every member of staff has, has uh, within their job description the, the requirement to comply and actively promote council's policies and procedures on all aspects of equality. Um, therefore the recommendations from the members today is that members approve the revised disability action plan. Thank you members. Okay, thank you Yale. Um yeah, again, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Yellen. I um, uh, want to welcome the report and the recommendations within it, and, and I'm sure we'll all agree to approve it. Um, again, it is, uh, I suppose, just in terms of um, local government is central and key to every element of community life um, and local community, and that is indeed given every adult the opportunity to participate, and I think this report um, is inclusive of that. Um, and it's good too that the dementia friendly cities and that is involved, towns and cities is in, involved in that also. Um, I just I just want to say, I mean, people with a disability bring a broad range of uh, expertise, knowledge and skills um, uh, through participation and through the work that we have been doing in council and certainly in my time as mayor. Um, I, I, I saw that within this council and I just want to acknowledge that the good work that we do uh, for Section 75 groups, particularly those with um, people with disabilities and, and the minority groups. So um, I approve the, the report and, and, and welcome it. Thank you. And everyone then? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, both seconder. <laughs> Uh, thanks for that report there. Uh, and on the item 13. Um, through you, Chair, this report uh, seeks to provide an update on member learning and development and to seek approval for updated member role descriptions and an updated elected member learning and development policy. Uh, again, as I say, the 
the background of this report is really that this council has a well-established member development process and structures in place and indeed uh, we have le uh, member learning and development is led by an elected member development group. Um, in terms of the key issues, um, the, the report itself identifies that, that due to COVID there have been a number of courses um, which have been postponed for year one of the programme so therefore we have updated the uh, development program uh, to reflect the rescheduling of these courses and indeed uh, NILGA which um, has also rescheduled or postponed a number of the uh, training activities which they had committed to at the start of the, the, the year as such. Um, the member job description, so therefore as I say members there's an updated program there. In terms of the role descriptions they've been drawn up um, and the skills and knowledge is identified from the local government um, political skills framework and or the 21st century uh, councillor um, framework. Um, the policy itself has been reviewed by the, the um, development group and is attached uh, as well in terms of an appendice. Um, we've also, as a key part of, of the learning and development, of, of engaged in effectiveness assessments and happy to report that 100% of the participants for all training courses provided uh, rated their satisfaction with their training as either being good or excellent and there were no areas of improvement identified uh, in area, any area of, of the training. Um, and also that is to say we have evidence to demonstrated that all the courses were delivered by council um, were value for money. Um, we also did an equality analysis and whilst there was no obvious barriers to access, um, I think it's important that going forward that there is more engagement with members to ensure that the content format or scheduling of training courses enhances enhanced participation. Um, I suppose then the, um, the action plan as well for the development group has also been attached and uh, I would report that in terms of the um, Northern Ireland Charter Plus accreditation, it's now scheduled um, for the assessment in October. Um, ultimately, um, this is where we screened a new policy and it was screened out. Um, so the recommendations in front of members is to note the update and also to approve the updated member role descriptions and the updated member uh, learning and development policy. Thank you, members. Okay, well, thank you for that there. Um, proposed seconder. Uh, item 14. Um, through you, Chair, it's this report advises members of an amendment to guidance on councillors' allowances, which was issued by the Department of Communities in August, and also to seek approval for an updated scheme of allowances. Um, and, and as outlined there at paragraph 3.2, the addendum, uh, which, the mem which the Department has issued, addresses the issue of renunciations, uh, and that has now um, been reflected in the new scheme. So subject to members' comments, the updated scheme of allowances uh, um, is recommended for adoption. Thank you, members. Okay, thank you, Young. Um, uh, no. Proposer and seconder. Which one? Did you propose, Chair? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and for information. Um, Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, item 15. And how will you do that? Um, well, there's not been approaches to the desk. I'm quite happy to just give group members. It's fairly self explanatory. It's a timing issue. Um, so, when the tender comes back at the end of November, um, the time, or during November, by the time it's evaluated and awarded, there may be a timing issue to get the um, So, the recommendation from Insurance and risk manager is on this basis that um, he has decided to move into the calculated ability to make a decision in respect of that tender and report to the current committee of register of decisions um, to enable us to uh, award the tender within that time. Okay, thank you. For information, then, uh, six, item 16. Take another. 
I'm interested in proving to. Proposed or seconded? I just turned on the next one again. Yeah. So, uh, confident, I'm the confidential now. Sure. Can I come on item number 17? I thought you were going to do the number that's here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sure. This, this is a report that I've asked for far back, I think, is June, regarding the activities in Nickel, all the group known as Unity of Purpose. And the report we have for you today is very, there's not a lot in it, and no, that's not a reflection on, on, on the officers who, who wrote this up, because I believe they can only work we, you know, what they're dealing with. 